Ever since I was a kid, birds scare the bejeepers out of me. At Universal City in California, director Alfred Hitchcock and Tippi Hedren. And I blame it on Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. On this film trip, I go to the birds, literally. I travel to the coastal town of Bodega Bay, California, the setting for Alfred Hitchcock's 1963 film. I fly north on a windswept highway. All right, here he comes. He's wrecking the illusion that I'm floating completely out in the middle of nowhere. Attack the bay with my new friend, Surfer Bob, and hopefully bridge the gap between children and fear. Which will take a bit of work, seeing as I have my own issues. Whose idea was it for the convertible? With those feathered freaks. San Francisco. As a travel destination, it's a treat, all right. The splendor of the Golden Gate Bridge, the reclusive Alcatraz, the clang and clatter of a rollicking cable car, Evan Hunter's masterful script, The Birds, describes San Francisco as an anthill at the foot of a bridge. Of course, San Francisco is much more than that. And it's our first location in this episode of Film Trip. Fade in Union Square. Thank you for watching my movie. What were you expecting? Tippy Hedren. Really? <laughs> it's just me. Ooh. This is where the birds opens, right here. Hitchcock, like many of the guys in his time, started out his movies with one simple shot that was loaded with tons of information. And I mean, in this film, The Birds was no exception. Hey, that's just, that's just like in the movie. I mean, this is right where it happened. Tippy Hedren going across, we were cable cars. This is amazing. This has got to be where it is. Oh, thought it was for me. That was for Tippy. Hey, that's not the pet shop. There he is. Freeze it. It's a Hitchcock cameo. Hitchcock made 37 cameo appearances in his 52 film career. This one even included his own terriers, Joffrey and Stanley. By 1963, when The Birds was released, his cameos were placed early in the picture. By then, everyone was anticipating them, and he didn't want his signature moment to distract from the plot. The exterior of the pet shop was actually shot on a back lot in Hollywood. Now, Hitchcock wasn't really a big fan of, you know, being out in public like this. He often used a concealed camera to get most of his shots because crowds would gather around. You can imagine. You see Hitchcock, you know something's going on. Unlike me out in the public, I don't really care. I like the people, people like me. How you doing? Good to see you. That's just a guy saying hi to me. <laughs> Happens all the time. Now let's talk lovebirds. You remember the lovebirds, don't you? No? Well, let's review. Tippy and Mitch, Rod Taylor's character, have this flirtatious exchange in the pet shop. And later, Tippy buys Mitch two lovebirds and drops them off at his apartment. But Mel, from the Dick Van Dyke Show, tells Tippy that Mitch spends weekends in Bodega Bay. Tippy, with the two lovebirds, drives to Bodega Bay, thus inciting the shock and awe bird insurgents. So, what is it with the lovebirds? Were they good? Were they bad? Were they responsible for the uprising? I don't know, but Hitchcock loved to leave that up to you. Birds to this day still have a way of making people feel uh, nervous, unsure. But what exactly is a lovebird? I don't know about you, but other than the film, I've never heard of one. It turns out they do exist. All right, a pet shop. That means they got birds. They got birds, they got answers. Well, welcome to the Animal Connection. And I'm standing here with, uh, is it Joe Taylor? Joe That's Taylor. right, certified avion specialist. You have a lot of birds. How many birds you got in here? Anywhere from four to 500 birds. Now, does anybody ever come in and ask for a love bird? Absolutely. It's, I would say it's probably our second or third most requested bird. These are actual lovebirds. These are actual lovebirds. Now, how, how do you know they're in love? These two are actually in love because they've produced babies for us here in the fish. Do they require, like, special mood music or anything? No, nope, no okay. Barry White, no. No Barry White? No. I like Joe. That's pretty good, actually. All right, who is this? His name is Castro. Now, does he like people? He loves people. He loves people. If it's, if it's okay with oh, you, I'll let yeah, him out. Yeah, sure. You want to come out? 
Can you train them? You can train them not to chew on certain things. You really? can train them that when you're on the phone, they're not supposed to yell and scream. You teach Absolutely. that to my mom? No. <laughs> I am curious with all these birds. You think it's possible they would ever, like, band together? No. It's impossible. I think it's going to happen again. I saw it in a movie once. <laughs> it happened. I've seen the movie. And? It's impossible. It is. I don't know. It looked real to me. By the way, what are these guys' names? These guys are Breeders 1 and 2. Breeders 1 and 2? That way it keeps it simple and uh, looks good on a t-shirt. All right. Thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank I feel you. like a bird expert. And uh, do they ever stop they never talking? Stop. They never stop. All right. What? Thought I was going to get out of there with real birds? Not a chance. I had to sign a waiver just for these. This is Breeder One and Doug. All I know is we're going to take a trip together. <laughs> Come on, guys. I know, I know. It's not Tippy's Aston Martin, but any convertible will do the trick. Wow, I'm just like Tippy. I got the birds, the freewheeling attitude, and I'm flying north up Highway 1 to Modego Bay. Driving Northern California's Highway 1 is as big a rush as any suspense film. The dramatic windswept cliffs, the cold deep sea, it's exhilarating and frightening at the same time. It has got to be one of the best road trips in America. I'm somewhat surprised that so many tourists flock to Sonoma and Napa for the wine country, when just a short distance away they can experience these dramatic and surf washed seascapes. I can see everything from up here. You know, stark environments like this is how Hitchcock pumped up the fear. Think of the prairie in North by Northwest, or the Scottish Highlands in 39 Steps. There is something terrifying about being this exposed, yet modern filmmakers continually try to use confined, claustrophobic spaces to achieve that, when in reality, open spaces can be scary, too. That's what I'm trying to illustrate by this overdramatic attempt at acting. Well, I'm uh, no Jessica Tandy. <laughs> Who is? But at least I proved my point. Coming up, I go searching for Bodega Bay and find only the fog rolling in. What about the town? The schoolhouse? I've seen this movie a hundred times. The town is supposed to be right here. <laughs> this uh, look you see on my face is confusion. The movie was actually created out of two towns, Bodega Bay, where I am, and the actual town of Bodega, which is about seven miles from here. Hitchcock changed the geography of this entire area. Making a town was like rearranging the furniture. He envisioned a dense, bustling community at the edge of the bay, and if the geography couldn't accomplish that, production techniques could. Hitchcock was a guy that liked to sit. I can understand that. I've been known to enjoy the sedentary arts. Basically, his films were created from his armchair. That was Hitchcock's true genius. With storyboards and production diagrams, he could visualize an entire feature film on paper. I mean, who does that? I do. In fact, here's a storyboard of this shot right here. Uh, here's me on the wharf, and there's the bird right there. Uh, that's a close-up of me, and this is a shot of me holding my storyboard, which is really eerie. <laughs> I, uh, wonder why Hitchcock picked this place. Here it is. The wharf where Tippy Hedren boards the boat to head over to Brenner's farm. I mean, this is amazing. This place looks exactly the same way it did in 1963. And to think that Hitch and Tippy stood right here, I mean, she got down that ladder. And that's the Tides Wharf restaurant. And here's me. I'm part of the movie. Sorry. We're at the Tides Wharf complex, the central location of the movie. Now, by my calculations, the phone booth should be right here. But remember in the movie, Tippy comes running out of the restaurant, flying and getting away from the birds, and she's doing all this and everything, and that guy comes up and he slams his face right into the camera. <laughs> then out of nowhere, a horse-drawn carriage runs through the scene. I don't even know why that happened. <laughs> it was right here. Or was it over there? At the time of filming, the original Tides was owned by Mitch Zankich. Mitch let Hitchcock use the restaurant motel complex under a couple of conditions. He wanted the main character to be named after himself. So Rod Taylor's character in the movie became Mitch Brenner. What happened, Mitch? And he wanted a speaking part Go in the film. Go. There's the back of Mitch's head right there. Nice. Meet Marco Galazzo, 
the restaurant manager. If you need to know anything about the Tides, this is your man. Well, here we are at the Tides Wharf Complex. Yeah. And, uh, wow, you guys have a lot of stuff here. Well, behind us here, we have our fish market. We sell fresh fish. Uh, we sell wine, local cheeses, fresh bread from local bakeries. We have a gift shop for people that want to get a souvenir. Now, what type of impact did the birds have on the, on the restaurant. Alfred Hitchcock had read the sh short story by Daphne du Maurier about a uh, flock of birds that's yep. supposedly demonized and yep. takes over a small town. He was traveling through the area, stopped at the Tides, which was an already an established restaurant. Gotcha. And while enjoying a cup of coffee, he was looking out the window at some birds that were nesting over the uh, phone booth. And every time somebody would go to use the phone booth, the birds would attack them. <laughs> and he said, what a perfect place where I can make the movie that I wanted to make. Um, this is Hazel Mitchell when she was a waitress at the Tides. And you'll notice the waitress up here. Yes. Hazel with the glasses. Uh, for years and years, Hazel told everybody that that was her <laughs> in the movie. She finally confessed to me a couple years before her death that she couldn't be in the movie because she didn't have a SAG card. But Alfred Hitchcock found actors that looked like the real people in Bodega Bay. And Hazel had been his waitress every day when he was having lunch during filming. So he made I sure like that, that the waitress looked just like Hazel. <laughs> That's great. Bodega Bay is one of the top bird watching spots on the western coast. Now, what are the odds uh, of us getting attacked out here? Uh, pretty good. On the other side of the building, the, the little black birds are nesting. And those are the birds that Alfred Hitchcock saw attacking people in the phone booth. Well, let's go get attacked. Let's go. They've got nests all in these trees. There'll be about 15 of them that work together. One stays on top of the gas station. One stays on top of the sign that says the end of the tides. They don't usually bother the people that are visiting. Okay. But because I'm walking through their territory constantly, they know who I am. They don't so like me. Gee, what was that? <laughs> well, I can't thank you enough for the bird attack. <laughs> Something told me this was going to happen. <laughs> Meet Joel Hack, editor and publisher of The Birds by Hitchcock. He owns a treasure trove of material on the birds. Wow, you have a lot of stuff. This is mostly the publicity material surrounding the movie itself, The Birds. This collection really gives you a sense of Hitchcock's flair for promotion, along with other interesting finds. I got a package of pictures from somebody who was on the set during the filming, who, with their own personal camera, a Minox 16, took dozens of pictures. Oh. This is a program from okay. when The Birds was distributed in Japan. Why do you think the movie played well even in other languages? It played well in almost every language because it's, it's uh, universal. It's scary because it's about things that we don't have control over that are smarter than we are. Wow. And there's even still more to go through, believe it or not. All right, now, wait, now we've got to pack it all up. What? <laughs> now it's time to pay a visit to the farm across the bay. You remember Mitch's family farm, don't you? No? Well, let's review. Tippy arrives in Bodega Bay with the lovebirds. Oddly, she decides to deliver the birds to Mitch unnoticed by crossing the bay to the farm in a small skiff. Like no one would notice a jet-setting hottie draped in fur gliding across an expansive bay. But you have to admit, it's one of film history's most unforgettable moments. Well, for my trip across the bay, I couldn't find a boat like Tippy used in the movie, but well, that's so old school. I'm being new school by my accessory man, Surfer Bob. I always wanted a surfer dude as a friend. No worries, all it's right. gonna be good. I have a wetsuit here for you. You can throw that on kind of halfway up. I'll try a wetsuit. You did see what size I am, right? It's very stretchy. You might want to go right straight down to your uh, briefs. <laughs> you help me with that? Uh, I can hold the towel, I guess. <laughs> Sweet. The other stuff I'll let you take care of. <laughs> all right. Does this suit make me look fat? No, not at all. Actually, cool. All right, good. Look, uh, Svelte? Solid. Maybe I should put on two. If anything, your top half will go down, and at least your legs will know we can grab we, on. You can see something. me? Yeah. Thank you. My confidence <laughs> is growing <laughs> by the second. <laughs> what, what would a true surfer say um, right now, just before we head out? Um, let's see. A true surfer would say, it looks good. Let's go ahead and attack. It's good, man. All right. Let's go ahead and attack. Got to bring some birds. Paddle up to the shoulder. I'm up. And then give me a nice little bam, oh. bam, bam, bam. That's exactly it. And that's the way you should be on the boat. One, two, three. Oh. And he's out there. We've been scouring the shoreline for hours, only to discover the farm was nothing but a movie set. 
Here's the actual location, but the set burned down two years after the film was completed. My dreams of settling down in a bird-infested farmyard, gone. Well, I think I've had my fill of the bay. It's time to head inland to the town of Bodega. Coming up, I found the most popular thing to do at the Potter Schoolhouse. And later, I teach some school children how to have a flight of fantasy. The actual town of Bodega is seven miles from the bay. This quaint village is somewhat typical of small towns on the Sonoma coast. Its simple character reflects the hardiness of a fishing village. Immediately, you're experiencing deja vu. This beautiful old schoolhouse was built in 1873. Now, it was actually scheduled for demolition when Hitchcock spotted it and decided it'd be a perfect location for the movie. This is Leah Taylor, owner and current resident of the Potter Schoolhouse. She has lived in this schoolhouse since she was 12 years old. So how did this come to be at the, the Taylor House? Uh, well, in 1966, my mom was reading the Sunday newspaper, and she saw that the old school building, the condemned school building in the town of Bodega, was for sale. She said, oh, I want to see the inside of that building. So the school stopped in 1961, and Hitchcock was here in March of 62, and then it was vacant from that time until my parents bought it in 1966. But if you'll notice the Bodega Bay School sign, that's the sign that Hitchcock put on the building. And you can see he had it stylized exactly like the original sign. Is there any one question that people come in and want to know right away? Well, the most often asked questions are, uh, number one, what happened to the monkey bars? And the monkey bars were borrowed from the local elementary school, <laughs> and they went back when the shooting okay. was done. The school teacher's house, Suzanne Plachette's house yes. on the corner was a false front, as you can see. They know that somebody died on some steps somewhere. Well, it was those steps, not these. Believe it or not, at the Potter Schoolhouse, uh, renting this guy for a couple of bucks and dying on the steps is actually quite a real fun thing to do and one of the most popular. Now, next door is where uh, the teacher lives, and she died on those steps, not these steps, but since these steps are here, this is where people want to die. Go ahead and let me. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're scared. All right, now I'm getting freaked out. As long as we're on a tour of the area's iconic structures, here's another one, the gazebo from the film. You're probably asking yourself, what gazebo? Well, at the birthday party to the right of the frame, there it is. Not exactly front and center, but it is in the film. And here is Donna Freeman, proprietor of Compass Rose Gardens, where the gazebo has spent its last 45 years. But that's not all. Donna was actually in the film. Now, what scene were you in in the movie? I was in the scene where the car blows up in the parking lot. I think that might be Donna right there. I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> oh, well. It really wasn't in the film that much, but do you get a little bit of attention from having the gazebo? If I'd known I was going to get this much mileage out of this gazebo, I would have certainly enjoyed it more at the time. <laughs> Italian television, French television, it's just been incredible. It kind of has taken on a life of its own. Well, there's not really many authentic places left or real that's, pieces. That's right. This gazebo is, of course, in the middle of a beautiful garden. I see lots around. I'd love for you to show me around if that's OK. I'd love to show you around. So you've got paths, you got the water, the sounds. What do you like to do when you come out here? It's not so much a matter of what I like to do, but I usually need to work. <laughs> These are my five-fingered ferns, and I love them. Five, now I'm imagining they call them five-fingered ferns because there's like eight or nine. Yeah, of them. <laughs> that's why. I didn't know why. I, I was expecting five when you said that. These are forget-me-nots. Forget-me-nots. Yeah. All right. And that's the original Velcro, I'm sure. Well, I'm stuck on you too. <laughs> this is a beautiful forget-me-not, and I've had a wonderful time with you today. Thank you. Wasn't Donna great? The gazebo, the gardens, and of course my forget-me-not. Oh. And I didn't forget what's coming next. You guys are going to love this. It's been a while since I've been in school. Thought I'd get to know some of the locals. See if I can encourage them to get involved in something I got going on up here. Hitchcock helped generations of children, me included, experience fear firsthand. 
And I guess it's up to me to bring that fear to the next generation. Hi, guys. Hi. Wow, now see, that's what I like. Who here has ever uh, run from a bird? Anybody? All right, I'm not alone. What we're going to do is I'd like to see if you guys want to start a little tradition around here called the running of the birds. I want to hear everybody shriek like there's a bird. I think it's official. I think we've got a great group of kids to help me do the annual running of the birds. All right, everybody, come on in. <laughs> when I yell, action, I need everyone to be safe, I need everyone to be loud, and I need you to be scared. Action! <laughs> That is energy like I've never seen. <laughs> it's funny that I came to this town looking for hostile birds, but instead I found a peaceful and serene environment. I guess the atmosphere of a place always comes down to the cast of characters. And this cast, well, they could belong to a feel-good summer blockbuster. They have truly made this a special travel experience. Bird guidebook, it's all yours. <laughs> Who said the birds aren't fun? On this film trip, I've been captivated by the stunning landscapes and rugged geography. And I can understand how this setting inspired the mood of the film. Speaking of mood, how about this? The ambiguous end of the movie. The final image that messed with my head when I was a kid. What did the birds want? What was their deal? The film was made in 1963. Before global warming, before the first energy crisis. There wasn't any environmental legislation at that time. And yet, current audiences can see the environmental message. Hitchcock was pretty in tune with his audience. The absence of important plot details that motivate the story was prevalent in all Hitchcock's work. He called it a MacGuffin. An interviewer once asked Hitchcock to define the word MacGuffin. Hitchcock replied, a MacGuffin is a tiger that lives in the Scottish Highlands. There are no tigers in the Scottish Highlands, the interviewer said. And Hitchcock simply replied, exactly, that's a MacGuffin. We are so close to the Tides restaurant right now, and believe it or not, I just found something. The actual phone booth. No, the door Okay, But there's really no doors on it. Back, piece of glass, so the birds obviously took it all out of here. Excuse me, hello? Oh, hi, Tippy. It's me, Scott, from Film Trip. Oh, sorry, I gotta put a quarter in. Oh, I think we're about to be cut off. Oh, I got one, hold on, yep, all right. Okay, hello, hello? Lost her. Well, you know how that goes. That's the cost of doing films. Huh. Home booth. 